one of the underlying issues of, of retention and training hasn't changed much in 20 or 30 years. Um, employers are afraid to spend money and get people trained because they're going to leave. And people who get trained, they're afraid they're not going to get paid enough, so they leave. Welcome to the podcast, y'all. Um, Aaron, thank you for coming. And Paul, welcome back. You're the first three-timer on the Fire Code Tech podcast. He's a celebrity by now. I'll get my star. <laughs> Man. Um, yeah, so uh, we have two individuals on the podcast this time, but I kind of wanted to kick it off in classic podcast fashion and, and talk with Aaron and know get a bit of background on her career experience and uh, typically that's always the first question on every one of these shows is you know how did you find your way um, into contact with fire and life safety and a bit of background on your career Erin if you would please yeah sure well thanks for having us both Gus I'm not nearly as famous as Paul but I'll do my best um so as Gus was saying, my name is Erin Easton. I'm a, the workforce uh, director of workforce development at Cape Fear Community College currently. I've been here a couple years, um, and that's really how I was introduced to fire alarm systems and fire alarm training. Um, but prior to that, I've always worked in some form of education, whether it was teaching in, in high schools and younger, younger students. Um, but most of my adult career has been spent in college and workforce development training. So um, not always teaching, understand methodologies and things like that, but more business development, partnering with our community partners, um, not just businesses, but different community organizations to make sure that we were helping our community to grow into professions that are well-paying, enjoyable, and they have the right skill set to do so. So I've spent about the last 21 years of my career doing that. Um, and when I came to Cape Fear, one of the programs that I started working with was Paul's uh, Fire Alarm System Training Program. And quickly realized that we had this apprenticeship program that needed to be dusted off so that we could help our business partners, not only here, but nationally, since this program is offered anywhere, essentially, um, to grow their businesses, make sure they can retain their staff and, and folks are well trained to do a great job. So um, yeah, thanks for having oh, us. Well, thank you so much for the great introduction to your career and a bit about the apprenticeship program. You know, I want to dive deep into the apprenticeship program, but um, just for the listeners before we uh, touch that issue, you know, um, it's uh, different that we get to have a guest on the podcast with a lot of uh, business development background and kind of uh, marketing and um, corporate experience. So, you know, I just wanted to hear a bit more from you, Aaron, about um, those different roles you've had and kind of paint that picture for what that skill set looks like for the listeners because um, it's valuable when it translates to people in fire and life safety who are um, looking to do business development, you know, it, regardless of if it's in engineering or as a technician or as a designer, um, these skills are all. Uh, valuable and appropriate. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about um, a couple of those different roles, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so being in education doesn't always seem like business development, but when we're talking about training our, our existing workforce and trying to find a new workforce, it truly is business development because all, all business owners and leaders know that it really starts with those folks that work for you, right? Um, over the last several years, we've seen a lot of changes in workforce. Um, we've seen people leaving positions a little bit quicker than they used to, um, oftentimes changing into the same type of role, maybe for 50 cents or a dollar an hour more. So businesses have really struggled to hold on to their talent, um, and they've, they've been trading talent with their competitors. So when we think about education and business development going together, one of the things I've really been working with our fire alarm uh, partners on, business partners on, is how do we 
keep your employees, make sure they're well-trained, um, have some sort of succession plan for them um, as a way to feel that they, they belong at your business um, and you can show that you care about their development. And, and really the dusting off of this apprenticeship program a couple of years ago was, was how we started to impact that. Um, when you're, you're trying to grow your business, you need the workforce and you need them to be well-trained. Well, an apprenticeship provides just that. Um, so unlike many apprenticeship programs that are out there, businesses traditionally think, okay, if I start an apprenticeship, I have to be in charge of everything. I need to create the curriculum. I need to find someone to teach that curriculum. I need to take care of all of the paperwork, all that minutia of, of collecting and gathering hours and things like that. And, and that takes away from, from their business and their day-to-day. -day. Uh, so at Cape Fear, we really take that, that burden off of our business partners. Um, we hold the apprenticeship. We have the approval. So it's a Department of Labor approved program. Um, we all obviously are the experts in curriculum, but we've utilized not only Paul's knowledge, but our businesses, par business partners knowledge to ensure that we're teaching the skill set that's needed, that we're updating curriculum constantly with different codes and making sure we're, we're on point. Um, so the college holds the apprenticeship and we have these business partners that we sign an agreement with saying, hey, we're, we're going to do this program and we're going to provide the on the job training, which is what they're great at. That hands on getting these folks out into the field to, to really learn what they're taking from their book work and their exercises into the, the workforce. What this is allowing businesses to do is truly leverage um, retaining their people. So you've got a, sometimes a two-year apprenticeship program, a four-year apprenticeship program, and many businesses are paying the fee for the students to take the course. These um, individuals are full-time employed, so they're earning a pay wage and they're guaranteed a pay increase every year that they're successful. And success really just means I've, I've passed my class and, and I've worked full time that year towards some of these goals to, to make sure I have the training I need. Um, we even have some business partners that are paying for their folks time to do their, their classwork throughout the week. Um, so we've really been able to evolve um, our business relationships in, with the times. How do we keep people retained? How do we uh, get interest in new people joining the field? Um, and apprenticeship seems to be a really great way. And, and so far it's working well. That's awesome. I really appreciate you expanding on um, apprenticeships and what that means for business development and continuity and retaining of skilled labor. Uh, that's something that, you know, I, I work in fire protection, engineering, consulting, and it's just a constant struggle to keep talent um, retained and um, happy. So I think that is problems that are ubiquitous. So appreciate you touching on that. Um, yeah. Up next, I just had a couple of questions about the program and maybe, you know, um, Aaron, you can give an answer and chime in. And then Paul, if you have um, something to tag on or add on to these next couple of questions. I think that would be great um, since you have a lot of knowledge about um, the apprenticeship program and just fire alarm uh, knowledge in general. So um, that's just kind of my thoughts on the next segment. But yeah, uh, Aaron, you spoke a bit about what these programs consist of and um, how the focus for this episode is the fire alarm apprenticeship program. But yeah, what other information would you give about um, the apprenticeship program and just like a high level, what that looks like for somebody who's interested in hearing more about it. Yep. So um, as I mentioned, we kind of take the non-traditional approach to this where the school is going to hold the onus of most of the, the, the nitty gritty details, paperwork reporting back to the state um, and the Department of Labor, which, which is a definite benefit for businesses that have folks participating in this. Um, I think it's also important to understand that we can be flexible um, as much as we can. So apprenticeship programs are ultimately approved and, and uh, recommended through the Department of Labor, right? So you, you've got to follow certain rules. So there's a certain number of hours 
um, that apprentices need to complete on the job and a certain number of hours that apprentices need to complete in the classroom. And one of our recent partners that we're, we partner with quite a bit um, would, wanted to see some changes made. Um, and some things are easy to do. So we have a four-year apprenticeship program. Um, students take one class a year uh, fully online. So you can be anywhere in the country or, or out of the country for that matter. I think Paul said that he's had most, almost all states, right, Paul? You've had everybody from every state. And are you missing a continent or something? I can't remember what you said the other day. I've lost track. The state's probably more than half. But yes, we do have six continents and we're waiting for Antarctica to come on board. <laughs> That's cool. So as soon as those two people that work in Antarctica are ready, we'll help them. <laughs> but um, there's a fireman somewhere over there that wants to get it started. I yeah. So, so this 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 business partner you work with um, is is thinking even more about retaining and, and how do I keep folks? And four years seems like a long time, right? Stay with me, and we'll keep training, and we'll slowly increase your wages. So, currently working with them on keeping the same amount of content in the program, but perhaps just changing how we deliver the information uh, for the educational piece and shortening the program that way to two years. Um, still same content, perhaps a little bit, tiny bit more intensive for the folks, but they truly feel that if we can make something that is a little bit more aggressive, it keeps people more interested and involved. Um, which I understand, four years does seem like a long time in some situations. So I think it's important to note that we can be customizable to some extent. Um, and that we also don't just offer the apprenticeship program. And many folks out there know about the course we've been teaching for many, many years, the Fire Alarms 101 and 102 courses um, that have awesome content in it and help folks get ready for their NYSET certifications or have them earn CEUs that they need to continue to keep those different credentials. So we have many folks that take those and we really work with each individual business to determine what's the best fit for the individual. So most of our businesses that we partner with don't just participate in either apprenticeship or the coursework. We do a combination of both. Um, and I would say that the apprenticeship is really great for those more green folks that are coming into the industry. If a business is looking to hire and they're struggling to find people, this is a really great way to take somebody that you've interviewed and you say, man, they have a really strong work ethic. Um, they've done some things electrical, but not exactly what I need. Um, and if you put them in an apprenticeship program, you can really train that person up and, and have a well-qualified employee. But if you've got somebody that's been with you for many years, has been very successful, has a really great knowledge, and maybe their next step is to, um, to get a NYSET uh, certification, then maybe an Alarms 101 or 102 class or combined would be a great choice for them so that they can have the professional development that they need. So flexibility and different opportunities is really important so we can meet business needs where they're at. That's awesome, Erin. I appreciate that um, kind of characterization of who would be a good fit or some different um, educational profiles that might be beneficial to the listeners or maybe somebody the listener knows. Paul, in your mind, who do you see as a good fit for the program? Um, you know, I'm sure you've seen um, everything from the engineer to the technician to the designer and everything in between. But what do you think of when you're, you know, thinking of who would be a good fit for the program? Everyone. Uh, that's the, probably the easiest uh, question. And I think one of the most powerful aspects of our apprenticeship program is flexibility. Uh, my electrical career started out in the United States Navy and uh, I was aboard uh, carrier and you take off for six months and go on a cruise. And uh, I wasn't in an apprenticeship program as an electrician. Uh, we had uh, civilian instructors on board from the city colleges of Chicago that taught college level courses for anybody who wanted to participate. And of course that went over to the apprenticeship as well as far as the classroom. But like in any business or job, I mean, we were working eight, 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus we had at least four hours, six hours of watch. So you're pulling 18 hour days, seven days a week for six months and try to go sit in a classroom and, and look at a book. 
uh, when I discharged, I continued to the uh, electrical apprenticeship with the uh, employers that I had. It seemed that uh, the companies from the north were more um, in tune with the apprenticeship. It wasn't really widespread in the south. Uh, but then again, you were working 10, 12 hours a day on a job, and then you'd have to go to the trailer at night for an hour or two and, and do your classroom. It was just, just hard and just tough to get there. Uh, with our classes and with the apprenticeship program, you can participate anytime, anywhere on the planet at your leisure. So you don't have to drag yourself there after work or try to get there whenever you have a few moments. Um, everybody's on the internet now, so it's not like you have to go to the library and get on a computer. You just pick up your phone. Uh, there's a Blackboard app for the uh, courses that we teach. We use Blackboard. It's a third-party platform. They have an app on your phone, and boom, you're in class in a couple seconds. So flexibility all the time, everywhere. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the biggest personal um, things that I can vouch for for the program is just having Paul as a resource and being able to speak with Paul and have him, and he's very responsive and uh, wants to see you succeed. So uh, that's one thing I can vouch for, uh, knowing Paul, uh, being a uh, colleague of his in the industry, He's very knowledgeable and he wants to see these people succeed. So um, that is a big positive about um, these programs at Cape Fear Community College. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if people want to find out more and we can drop some links in the show notes for people who want to go investigate. But um, for the people who are listening now, uh, where should people go to find out more? about the apprenticeship programs and the fire alarm training at Cape Fear Community College. Yeah, so I think there's quite a few different ways. Um, so obviously we have a website, right? Um, I, I, I can put the link in, like you said, at the end of the show so you can have it. But um, one of the easiest ways to find us, and we're typically the first thing to pop up, is a simple Google search of CFCC, so Cape Fear Community College. Um, fire alarm systems, and it's going to bring you right to our page. We're one of the first links. Um, folks can also send me an email for any information or questions so we can set up a time to talk about your individual needs. Um, my email address is just e easton, so it's e e a s t o n at cfcc.edu. And then Paul has a really great social media presence with our programs on LinkedIn. I'm sure many folks are, are uh, part connected with him through that platform, and we're continuously sharing um, links, information about the program, start dates, things like that. Can you think of anything else, Paul, or any other way? Well, my big magic answer was, was, was LinkedIn, and we do have a, a group as well on LinkedIn for the, for the program, and that recently went public in August. So... Now anybody can find it on, on the planet. We're not hiding anymore. Awesome. Awesome. We'll add those links. Um, just wanted to, I always like to end the show with some professional development topics because if people who are usually seeking these podcasts out are looking to learn and um, sharpen their skill set as a, a professional. But yeah, I just wanted to ask Aaron and Paul, since you guys both have such a um, a wealth of knowledge and education. What are you guys seeing as a trend? I know you talked uh, already about retention and being creative about um, retaining skilled staff, but I'd love to hear your insight on that topic. Yeah, I think one of the biggest trends and not just in fire alarms and education in general is a, a college or a school or training provider's ability to be flexible with that individual that's seeking the training. So we've already talked about our, our program being online and how that creates a lot of flexibility for folks. But the other big key is people need to go to work, right? So it, it's not necessarily the age of, hey, I need to go to college for eight years, get my master's, then go to work. I may be doing that, but I also need to be able to make ends meet or have a well-paying career while I'm, I'm searching um, for maybe an advanced career. And things like an apprenticeship or a program that you can take online while you're working full-time really allow people to get that new skill set and still maintain the livelihood that they need for themselves and their family. Um, so I think we'll see more and more. We're going to head back to the days of it's okay not to have a four-year degree. I, I can get a well-paying job. 
um, in a technical field, in a, in a skilled trade, um, because I, I've, I've got to be working. I mean, we've all seen prices increase on everything, um, you name it, right? Um, so, so we all know that we need to have some type of stability in order to receive the training. So I, I think that's a huge trend we're going to keep seeing going forward. Definitely. Definitely. Paul, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are that one of the underlying issues of, of retention and training hasn't changed much in 20 or 30 years. Um, employers are afraid to spend money and get people trained because they're going to leave. And people who get trained, they're afraid they're not going to get paid enough, so they leave. So as Aaron was talking, I think I just had a spark of genius where just create a contract between the employer and the employee. And basically the contract says that we're going to provide you with this training and this knowledge. And upon successful completion, we're going to give you a raise. And we ask that you sign this non-binding agreement that you're going to stay with us for a year or so. Um, and then both parties have the confidence that they're going to stay and they're going to get the wages that they feel that they, they need as far as that certification. Yeah, Paul, I'm always hardened when I speak with people who have experience in the industry and they remind me that these are not new problems. That staff retention and, and you know, building knowledge in a, a people is not a new problem. So I know that we have a new cultural shift towards uh, people moving jobs more frequently, but, um, you know, this... Uh, idea of how to treat people well, how to make sure that people can have the livelihood that they're after um, and, uh, you know, have a family, have a life. Uh, that's not a new problem. So just wanted to touch on that. Um, but yeah, uh, Aaron, you know, we spoke a little bit about your business development acumen and just your experience and how that's a unique skill set for the podcast. I just wanted to um, double down on that. Uh, topic and ask you about um, any advice you would have for somebody who is in a place in um, really any business role, or you could zoom in on fire and life safety specifically um, for business development or marketing skills. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think people or any businesses best front for improving business, marketing their services, and, and by people first looking at your front line, the folks that work for you. Um, you've, you've got to build value with them, trust with them um, to help give your business a competitive edge. So whether that means training, right? Whether that means, as Paul just mentioned, some type of uh, agreement where we're saying, hey, let's build this relationship together so it's mutually beneficial. Uh, but they're going to be your front line of doing good work for you. And that's what's going to keep customers talking about, about your business and in sharing the news. And they're also going to be advocating for your business. So they're going to be marketing and talking about how they enjoy what they're doing and the knowledge that they have. So I really think thinking of your employees as your front line, as part of your marketing strategy to, to develop your business. Um, is a necessity um, because that's really where the rubber meets the road, that this person that's working for you is the face of your organization and helping to advance and, and find new customers and keep your current clientele. That's great. I enjoyed that. Paul, what are your thoughts as a, a business owner and somebody who has been um, the public face of the program at Cape Fear Community College? What are your thoughts on um improving business development and or marketing skills? Well, I think every fire alarm company has a marketing team. They just don't realize that that team is their technicians. Uh, that's, that's the front line of their business. So if I was wanting to have a successful installation company, I would have a fleet of nice white clean vans with our logo on it. I would give the employees a couple hours a week and a stipend to keep their vehicles clean and washed. Um, give them a nice work shirt. Again, make sure that's nice and clean because these technicians go in every business and every installation in the country and around the world. Every business has a fire alarm. So as technicians have to come in, they have to do an inspection. Uh, they have to service it. Uh, typically when you do an inspection, you're walking around all the offices, all the cubicles, all the spaces, 
So that company sees that technician and that's the, the front line and that's the marketing wing. So if you have a nice clean van, a professional, well-shaven technician that shows up, uh, the company has a sense of confidence and what you don't realize is other technicians are seeing that nice clean work van riding around and maybe they want to get a nice clean work van and a nice shirt. So that in itself would attract talent just by professionalism and, and that frontline technician marketing team. Yeah, I appreciate that, Paul. Um, I think both of you guys iterated on um, building value and the services that you provide, um, having good uh, appearance and just candor with customers. And I think that's all great advice for people um, who are looking to uh, build business development skills is, you know, you don't have to get fancy. You can focus on the basics and you can be good at those things and create value for your customers. And I think you'll be surprised on how far that goes. Um, but yeah, uh, any other topics that you guys would like to cover? I think uh, I really enjoyed talking about the program, but yeah, anything that I didn't touch on that you guys would like to speak to uh, at the end of the podcast? I can't think of anything. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Paul, do you have anything? Oh, uh, no, again, I guess we do appreciate the, the, the invite and um, classes do start September 4th. Registration is now open. Uh, Aaron said we're all over the internet, just FAST, F-A-S-T at C-F-C-C, FAST at, at C-F-C-C. And uh, it's number one on your Google search, we guarantee it. Awesome. Well, sounds good, y'all. Well, go check out the show notes if you guys are interested. And yeah, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.